the conditions of human life are such that suffering is an integral part of existence. Life is suffering. Why? Well, one reason is because of society's arbitrary judgment. Every single one of us has traits and features and, and quirks and idiosyncrasies that are far from ideal and that are judged by the standards of society as insufficient. And so you suffer because of your imperfect insufficiency in the eyes of others. And you can certainly make the claim that fairly frequently that's arbitrary. And so that's the claim that society is tyrannical and judgmental and needs to be constantly reconstituted so that the tyrannical element doesn't take full control. And fair enough, you have to stay awake so that that doesn't happen. But the thing is, it doesn't matter what society it is, although they vary in the degree of their tyranny. The mere fact that you're grouped together with other people and have to come up with a common value structure in order to live together means that many of the things that characterize you are going to be suboptimal. And so the price you pay for social being is that much of you is deemed insufficient. Now, hopefully there are various ways that you can be within a society that's sufficiently diverse so that you can find a place where what's good about you in the eyes of others and perhaps in your own eyes can flourish of its own accord. Because you don't have to be good at everything. If you can be good at one thing well enough, that might allow you your niche. And hopefully a healthy society allows for that. Certainly societies can become so tyrannical that they don't. The other element of it, clearly, is the mere fact of the arbitrariness of the natural world. If you have a lifespan that's going to be counted in the number of decades that you can count on two hands. And that has nothing to do, technically, with the tyranny of the social structure. Now, you could say, if we got our act together more completely, perhaps you could live longer, and fair enough. But the fact of the limits of your lifespan and the suffering that's necessarily a consequence of that, the death of your parents and the death of most people that you will know be before you, means that that part of suffering is an integral part of existence itself. And so, that can't be laid at the feet of an insufficient social structure, except insofar as it's tyrannical and blind. It's a condition of existence. And then, by the same token, you have your own responsibility for some of your unnecessary suffering, because there's things you could be doing to make your life better, and to make life better for other people, that you know perfectly well that you're not doing. So there's three reasons why you suffer, and one is, well, look at you and the way you're built. It's inevitable. There's not very much of you, and there's a lot of everything else. And so, you just don't last that long, and you're fragile across multiple domains, and then you're harshly treated by society, and there's no doubt about that. And then there's responsibility that can be laid at your own feet. The proper pathway through that is to adopt the mode of authentic being. And that is something like refusing to participate in the lie, in deception and the lie. To orient your speech as much as you can towards the truth. And to take responsibility for your own life and perhaps also for the lives of other people. And there's something about that that's meaningful and responsible and noble, but also serves to mitigate the very suffering that produces say, the nihilism or the flee into the arms of totalitarians to begin with. You need something to shelter you against your own vulnerability. And you can adopt a comprehensive description of reality that's formulated for you by someone else that neatly divides the world into those who are innocent and perhaps innocent victims and those who are guilty and perhaps the perpetrators of the suffering. But none of that has anything to do with you. And in addition, if it's not a reasonable way of assessing the world, that the suffering is built in. The existentialist take is, no, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. You don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine, but it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward, there's a pathway forward, and the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility so that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable 
of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering and that the pathway forward as far as the existentialists are concerned is by, well certainly by the avoidance of deceit, particularly in language, but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them. And the thing that's so interesting about that is, well two as far as I'm concerned, and some of this is from clinical experience, you know if you take people and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades-long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet. Because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider. But there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well... Imagine that many people did that, because we've done a lot as human beings, we've done a lot of remarkable things. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste, or how many hours a week you waste, and the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now, and it's... Because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it, because I'm not going to last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? Most people find deep meaning in their life as a consequence, not, not of their rights or, or their impulsive pleasures even, but as a consequence of bearing responsibility for themselves, for their family, for their community. And the heavier the responsibility, the better. Well, Professor Stephen Hawking, before he died, gave me his last television interview, and he said that the biggest threat to the future of mankind was when artificial intelligence learned to self-design. Hmm. What do you think the biggest threat to mankind is? Narcissistic compassion. Now, AIs, you know, it's a threat too, but if we, if, we were, if we had our act together ethically, it's possible that AI could become a, a useful servant rather than a tyrannical master. You don't want to automate your tyrannical masters. The ideal that you're observing that makes you jealous and resentful is in large part an illusion that's created by your own mind. You know, I, I can give you just one example. It's like I know a fair number of extremely wealthy people and and I tell you, man, they have a burden of responsibility that would, would crush me, would crush the typical person. They're, they're just working flat out, like 90 hours a week. You know, they have their money, and, and they have their status, and that's not nothing. But don't be thinking that there isn't a price to be paid for that. You know, they don't see their families, they're often divorced, they don't see their children grow up, and they don't have time off. Now, there are wealthy, what would you call, playboy types, I suppose, who live out the dreams of wealth of a foolish 14-year-old, but they're not that common, and you have to be careful of what you're jealous of, because you don't really know what it is. And, and then the other thing to understand, you're, you're quite different from other people, and 
you shouldn't be comparing yourself to them because they're not like you. You know, they, they don't have your family. They don't have your temperament. They don't have your troubles. They don't have your abilities. The only, the only person that has those is you. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. And see, that's a game you can win because you could be a little better today than you were yesterday. Most of the time when you're discussing something that needs to be discussed, everybody's actually rather upset about it. You know, if you're actually talking right. about something sure. important, right? Because why talk otherwise, unless you're just shooting the breeze? But if there's an issue at hand that has to be discussed, then people are already upset and they have different viewpoints. And, and the, the, the offensiveness in some sense is built into that. And you know that because if you have a family, if you have a wife, if, if you have an intimate relationship and you're discussing something that's difficult, the probability that you're not going to offend each other if you're actually having the conversation is zero. And so to, you don't have to think unless you have a problem. And if you have a problem, then when you think, you're going to offend people. And so, so what, are we not going to think? That seems like a bad idea. Liberals are higher in openness, that's trait creativity, and lower in conscientiousness, especially orderliness. And that seems to be because they believe, or their, their, their niche is an informational niche. They believe that the free flow of information is worth the risk. So that'd be the free flow of people across borders, the free flow of ideas across borders, the, the free flow of concepts across categories. They'd rather that the borders were permeable. Now the conservatives are low in openness and high in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, and they take the opposite tack. They think, well, yeah, there's danger in too much openness. There's danger in borders that are too permeable. Things can change too fast. Entire societies can become destabilized and everyone can end up not knowing which way is up. And the, the thing is, is that both of those attitudes are correct. It depends on the time. You know, sometimes things are changing so fast that everybody's knocked off their feet and, and things are falling apart. And sometimes thing, things are so rigid that there isn't any new water flowing and, and everything's ground to a halt. You need liberals because now and then the right thing to do is to come up with something new. And you need conservatives because now and then the right thing to do is to do what everybody has always done. And the reason you need political dialogue is so that the liberals and the conservatives can continue wow. to argue about which of those Shh. solutions is appropriate right now. The game of dividing human beings up by their group identity ends in disaster, no matter who plays it and no matter what the reasons are. Adopt a stance of ready engagement with the world and to reflect that in your posture. And the reason that I write about lobsters is because there's this idea that hierarchical structures are a sociological construct of the Western patriarchy. And that is so untrue that it's almost unbelievable. And I use the lobster as an example because the lobster, we, we div divulged from lobsters in evolutionary history about 350 million years ago, common ancestor. And lobsters exist in hierarchies and they have a nervous system attuned to the hierarchy. And that nervous system runs on serotonin, just like our nervous systems do. And the nervous system of the lobster and of the human being is so similar that antidepressants work on lobsters. And it's part of my attempt to demonstrate that the idea of hierarchy has absolutely nothing to do with sociocultural construction, which it doesn't. 